Well, I'm at it again, ladies and gents. We're diving into another stupidly massive Middle Earth gaming board, but this time we're taking massive to a whole new level. By now you've seen all my mental monstrosities, the Pelennor Fields, Osgiliath, Edoras, and of course, the truly massive Siege of Gondor mega board. And they might be big, they might be wide, but none of them have truly mastered massive verticality. So, what location could be better for an absolutely massive, crazy tall mega board than the mighty labyrinthine halls of the dwarves, Khazad-dum, the Dwerodelf? The Mines of Moria. Mines of Moria. 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 Dark of Moria. Now this project actually began way back in 2017, just after I'd finished the first iteration of the Osgiliath board, and it was supposed to be my next big project. I spent months designing the ultimate layout, even drawing up a super complex schematic on graph paper so I could look through all of the different layers of the tall structure I had planned. For the footprint, I decided to constrain myself to a 9 by 5 foot wide cross section so that it would fit perfectly on my table tennis table, and then started playing with verticality finishing with a design that towered over eight feet tall. From the outset, my primary design through line was to create an immersive and continuous gaming board that condensed the entire structure of the Mines of Moria into one playable tabletop landscape, and yet featured all of the famous locations we see in the Fellowship of the Ring in perfect scale. I wanted a player to be able to deploy the Fellowship on one side of the board and literally walk through the entire structure following their journey and slowly discovering every single frame of the film, just as we did as viewers for that first time back in 2001. Starting with the dam and the watcher in the water at the Holland Gate, then the mithril chasm, the crossroads, the 21st hall, the chamber of Mazabal and Balan's tomb, the absolutely iconic stairs of khazad the second hall, the bridge spanning the mighty chasm, the first hall, and finally, the Eastern Gate and the Dim Rill Dale beyond. I sketched out all of these locations onto the board, adjusting them many, many times, and got them down on three different layers of graph paper, which then, overlaid, showed the cross-section of the three different levels of playable area. With these key sections in place, I could then add heaps of other features and locations to flesh out the mines for a super playable landscape that would work really well for lots of different styles of gameplay. Not to mention allowing me to include some more cool spots like Durin's Stair and the peak of Zirak Zigil, where Gandalf fights the Balrog, extra mines and dwarven architecture, and many cool passages and chambers. But before I dived into tackling this monstrosity in full, I was faced with a bit of a technical challenge. How do I get the different types of rock work, both naturally formed and carved by the dwarven stonemasons, to look realistic? And how do I get those interior surfaces to gel with the outer world beyond? So I set about making a small diorama that would function as a small display board and a proof of concept for the larger board to come. Now you guys know I'm all about realism in my builds, getting boards and layouts looking as detailed and immersive as possible, and all of that takes a lot of time, so I don't get out to cast a line as often as I'd like. But Fishing Clash has some of the most realistic and immersive graphics you've ever seen in a mobile game, and lets me explore epic fishing spots from the comfort of my home. I've been fishing with my dad since I was a kid, and there is nothing better than getting to skip straight to the action and bail on all the boring rigging and preparation, your favourite hobby is now in your pocket, ready to go in between the chaos of daily life. You can upgrade your rods and lures, compete with other players, take part in competitions, and even hone your fishing skills all in pursuit of every fisherman's dream, bagging an absolute beast of a fish. You can fish from the shore, from a boat, travelling the world to heaps of different locations, and if you download the game using my link below in the description and use my special gift code Fish with Zorpazorp, you'll get a three-star rod, one mythical lure, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help you catch a bigger fish. All this for a total value of $20. That is a banging way to start out as a new player. And supporting the sponsors that support me is so damn helpful, guys, so you can throw in a line knowing you're supporting me and getting some wicked chill time bringing in the big ones. To claim your gift, hit this button up here and enter the code FISH with Zorpazorp, and be sure to download using the link below in my description, and you're ready to join me out there on the water, nailing some monster fish. 
So it is time to get cracking on this display board. So first off to the sketchbook to mock up a plan. I love the idea of a dragon assaulting the eastern gate in the Dimril Dale, so I've opted for a nice tall door similar to the east gate of Moria, with some sort of row that I could have dwarves pouring out to defend their kingdom and buy time for the fortress to be sealed within. I then found myself a photo frame that would perfectly fit my display cabinet, so roughly about one by two foot, including the border. Next, I grabbed some one inch extreme of polystyrene, cut it to size, and then sketched up my design directly onto the foam surface, opting to set my cliff face at an angle and set the dwarven hold into the back left corner to really help it form a nice backdrop for the conflict. As I wanted to imply a mountainside setting, I set about terracing the foam to establish a slope that I could build up later with modeling compound, working down from the foam to the height of the frame itself. I then grabbed some two inch extruded polystyrene and threw it through my proxen to cut out a nice dwarven archway. With my components assembled, I did a dry fit to ensure I was happy with the layout and then grabbed a textured rolling pin and pressed heavily into the foam floor and walking rampway down the hill to give it some subtle worn flagstones. With a little bit of cutaway corners and some simple foam stripping, I added some little extra details to jazz up the archway and the inner hall and to complete the stonework, I textured the back wall with crumpled up aluminium foil and lined the walkway down the gate with some brickwork. A little bit of fast bond PVA and toothpicks and all of this is glued up and I'm ready to get on to the exciting part, which is the cliff face. To create our lovely rocky detail, I'm dipping into my big tub of woodland scenic rock molds and grabbing a chisel and smashing them down to size. Now these things are heavy, so we're lying the whole display board on its side with the arch facing up and then arranging a bunch of different rock mold casts onto the surface. To glue them down, I'm using high bond PVA for some long-term strength and then a bit of hot glue to give me a fast grab so that they can stay still while I blend them all together. Just let the hot glue cool off a little bit before you stick it down, otherwise you might melt the foam surface. Once they're all tacked on, it's time for the most amazing terrain product on the market, modeling compound from Geek Gaming Scenics. This plus a cellulose fiber blend gets mixed to a paste with a bit of water and then mashed in and all around the molds to fill the gaps and blend the joins. After about 10 minutes in the Aussie springtime, this stuff goes hard, so work fast and in small batches. As it dries, run damp fingers over all over it to ensure a nice blended finish and because this is of course made from plaster it just looks like one big seamless rock face. I've molded all the way around the edges of the cliff face and started to do a little bit of the lower landform as well. Now this piece we've made so far isn't actually glued or blended into the frame yet which enables me to go outside and prime all of the foam stone components with a foam safe black primer and then hitting it on a bit of an angle to create some shadows and highlights with a rust oleum gray and that begins the foundation of our stone paintwork. Just be sure when you're priming not to get any of the paint on the plaster rock face as we're gonna be doing some leopard spotting on that in just a second. To finish off the stonework, we'll give it a gentle dry brush with a generic light gray, focusing on really breaking up the crisp edges on the details and then throwing down a big old black wash all over it. This is my new black wash mix using some Liquitex inks shamelessly stolen from Jez's recipe over on Black Magic Craft. Cheers for that, big fella. Now, we get to the fun part. This is where the fun begins. To get some super realistic looking rocks, we'll be leopard spotting our plaster rock face. This technique involves mixing up a bunch of washes of different colors and dabbing them sporadically across the porous plaster surface. The plaster absorbs the washes and they blend and swirl together, staining and coloring the rock face in a very similar way to minerals of different pigments within real stone. I chose some darker colors than I normally do here and added a little bit of green as I'm hoping the darker stone will look more akin to that dappled moonlight setting I'm envisaging for my diorama. Once those washes are down, your Technicolor rock face, credit to Patreon Kenny Gage for that joke, will look super bright and garish. We'll wash all of this down with a heavy black wash to push all of those colors into the undertones. And once that wash is down and fully dry, out of nowhere, you will have a super realistic looking rock face. Now we're done with the messy part of the painting, we can glue this piece into our photo 
frame and use some more modeling compound to blend the rest of our slope. Give that a quick undercoat and we are ready to jump onto the other super exciting part of the diorama, the basing. Here we'll be using a whole host of products from the Geek Gaming Scenix range, all of which are available to purchase on my online store, zorbazorb.com. And up first, it's a layer of super tacky, ready basing glue, smooshed all over our ground surface. Apply this pretty heavily and wait for it to go tacky before we start dipping any stuff into it. The edges will go glossy on the sides and then you'll know it's ready. Our foundation of our surface ground covers will be a heavy sprinkling of the Scrublands Base Ready. This is a lovely aggregate blend of soils, rocks and flocks that is the perfect starting point for our mountain slope. To bring in a little bit of that alpine moss vibe, I'm then sprinkling in some green blend foam flock, which acts as a nice bonding layer as well because it'll soak up any glues or sealants and that'll lock down all of the larger aggregates. Then a few grass tufts sporadically through the landscape, especially up against the stone pathway and then we're ready for our first layer of sealant. To lock this all down we give it a good spray with isopropyl alcohol and then soak it in matte scenic sealant. This is a PVA varnish blend that will use the capillary action of the isopropyl to penetrate right down into the bottom layers of the flocks and aggregates. Now I did say that this was an alpine hillside so you can bet we're bloody using some beautiful snow effects but then I was struck by a bolt of inspiration. The greatest thing about snow is that it melts under fire. So why not try and really seat our dragon even more in this landscape by trying some burn effects. So I grabbed my absolute favorite base ready Grimdark City Rubble, which I'm used to sprinkling all over my 40k Necrons, and I'd sprinkled a long strip of it through the scrublands and up onto the roadway so that it acted like blackened ash and stones. It got caught in the tufts and the flocks and it really just looked like burnt ground cover. I then dabbed a brush into the base ready mixture to pick up some of the black pigment and heavily overbrush that onto a stonework just like you would do with a weathering powder. And by golly, it just looked fantastic. Then all we have to do is not let any snow fall on that area and the effect will really sell. So for our snow, we'll be using two different materials. First up is the Snow Powder Base Ready. This is a literal powder and is a little darker in color than pure white and looks amazing for melted snow. And then we've got the one millimeter snow static grass, which is bright and crisp and perfect for fresh snowfall or snow with a little bit of sparkle. So I'm gonna sprinkle little clumps of our powder all over the hillside. I want the snow to look like it's fallen a while ago and begun to melt, allowing our beautiful ground covers to shine through and create a stunning dappled patchwork of textures and colors. Then I'm gonna grab some of my one millimeter snow fiber and just sprinkle it on the top of some of the largest clumps to represent the light catching the tops of those little peaks and shimmering beautifully. Then I threw a couple of grass tufts and a little bit of green blend flock on our rock face and gave it a lovely snow treatment as well. If you hold the board on about a 30 degree angle, you can get a lovely cover on the rock face as you sprinkle your snow that reads beautifully and still looks like realistic snowfall. And with that, our display board is done. All that remains is to seal it like crazy. Absolutely soak it in matte scenic seal. And I did four or five passes, allowing it to fully dry in between. So there we have have an awesome little display board that I'm really, really happy with how it's come along. I love the blend of the dwarven architecture with the natural stonework, as well as those elements of the real world beyond. I'm really excited to bring lots of those kind of snowy exterior landscapes throughout the major diorama, I have little sections perched across the big build, flowing up to that tower at the top. I think this is a really great proof of concept that shows that these architectural stylings are gonna look absolutely awesome, and I cannot wait to start on the massive build. What do you guys think? Do you like the scale? Do you like the challenges this build's going to present? I cannot wait to get that playability, that epic scale on such a huge towering structure. And don't forget to use my code FISHWITHZORBASORB to get an awesome starter pack when you download Fishing Clash, link down in the description. And I will see you guys right here on Zorbazorb in the next one.